past is prologue. I am Farwell Brown, and today we're going to talk about the beginnings of the first church in Ames and, and possibly of some of the other churches that were early established in our town. That quotation that I gave you, the past is prologue, is cut into the stone on the corner of the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. And I like to use that to introduce a subject of this matter, on a matter of our churches. As you know, the town of Ames was laid out in 1864, late in the year and recorded in January of 1865. It was in that same year of 1865 that a group of eight people met with a young minister by the name of John White who had come from Woodstock, North Woodstock, Connecticut, to discuss the possibility of establishing a church in this little village. And I might point out that the population of the town was hardly more than a dozen or more people when they were first meeting because the first house in Ames had been built just a few months earlier. That was the Webster home, Noah Webster home, built where the Adams Funeral Home is today. And by the end of that year, there were hardly more than 10 or a dozen houses altogether in our village. These people met, as I say, in October of 1865, discussing the possibilities of establishing a church they met again in, in September, and it's on that meeting, September 12, 1865, that these eight people decided to establish a church and to affiliate with the Congregational Church nationally. These eight people represented three different denominations themselves. There were three Presbyterians, three Congregationalists, and two Baptists among them. I'd like to tell you who they were. There were H.F. Kingsbury and his wife, Mary Kingsbury. Mr. Kingsbury was our first postmaster in Ames and operated a store. Lyman Pierce and his wife, Phoebe, uh, were farm people that lived on the edge of town or near the village. There was Elizabeth and Robert Shearer and Cynthia Duff and John Whitlaw. Now, Cynthia's husband, Alexander, we hear very little about him, but we will hear about him very shortly. And we'll hear more about Cynthia in connection with the establishment of the first church in Ames. It was on December 25th, that's Christmas Day of 1865, that a meeting was held by these people in the home of Alexander and Cynthia Duff. You may recall that it was Cynthia Duff and Alexander who had bought this area of this land in 1863, two years earlier, and who had sold the piece of ground, piece of land where the original town of our city was located to uh, John I. Blair, the engineer who built the railroad across Iowa. So Cynthia Duff had a great deal to do with not only our town, but also with the first church that was established in our town. At that December meeting, they elected their first officers. Uh, Mr. Pierce was elected moderator, and Alexander Duff was the secretary treasurer. And the trustees were uh, Cynthia Duff, and Mr. Schur, and Mr. H.F. Kingsbury. Those were the first officers of our little church. Now I want to go back. Before there was talk of establishing a church, there had been circuit riders who had preached church services and conducted Sunday school in the area. Uh, the first uh, record that we have of a church meeting being held in, in the vicinity of Ames, uh, where Ames is now located, was when circuit riders conducted services in the Hoggett School, when it was located down near the Squaw Creek. We have uh, records of uh, several Methodist ministers, Reverend Doran and Reverend Hankins, 
and Presbyterian, a Presbyterian preacher from Nevada by the name of Isaiah Reed, who came about once a month. And in 1864, that's the year you will recall that the town was first laid out, they were conducting on somewhat of a regular basis church services in their little schoolhouse. There were also Baptist ministers and, uh, and others who I'm sure uh, conducted services in there. And by 1864, there had been organized a Sunday school that met in the Hoggett School. Here's the Hoggett School today as it has been restored up on the uh, uh, Meeker School grounds. This picture was taken on the day of its dedication in uh, 1981 or two. Here is a bird's eye view of our village as it was visualized by an artist in the middle 1870s. And by this time, we have the congregational church that we're going to talk about today up here on the corner of 6th and Kellogg on the northeast corner. Now that same church, that is a denomination, not the same building, is on that corner today. And in 1866, uh, the following year, following the foundation and establishment of the Congregational Church, the Methodists uh, established their church in Ames. Now, they already had a church up at Bloomington, and uh, some of their uh, pastors who had visited uh, the Hoggett School, for example, I do believe came from the Bloomington School. But they had built what they was known as the Methodist Chapel down on the corner of Kellogg and Main Street, the northeast corner. You see it right here in that artist's conception. And then a few years later in 1868, uh, the Baptist uh, Church was established and in 1872 they built their first church on the northeast corner of uh, Kellogg and Fifth Street. Now this is Kellogg, named after Cynthia's maiden name. Her name was Cynthia Kellogg before she married Alexander Duff. That street was locally known as Church Street at one time because you had, I've already named, three churches. And then in the middle 1880s, the uh, uh, Methodist Church moved up onto the corner of uh, uh, 6th and Kellogg right across from where the Congregational Church is. And the Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ, purchased the little chapel building from the Methodists, moved it over onto the corner of uh, Fifth and Kellogg. And uh, so you had four churches, all in a two and a half block uh, distance on Kellogg Avenue. Now here's the first church that the Congregationalists built. And October 7th, 1866, was a occasion of the dedication. It was a beautiful day. The air was crisp. The sun was bright. And everyone was, had been uh, encouraged to invite their guests from out of town. And that little church building was packed with people. And the dedication was, was held. Presiding that day was... Uh, uh, Josiah Grinnell, who was the founder of the town of Grinnell, who had uh, been instrumental in bringing the college from Davenport, known as Iowa College, to Grinnell, and uh, which they subsequently changed the name of the college to Grinnell College. He presided at that meeting that day. And I think it's interesting to know that uh, very early on, they've uh, wrote into their bylaws that the uh, uh, attendance at church and the right to use the pews would be free. Some of the uh, early uh, churches in, in New England uh, made charges. Uh, they call, I think they called them pew charges. But that was, they made a, a, a altered the bylaws to read that there would be no charge uh, considering the type of community that Ames was, that they considered. Josiah Grinnell it was a, uh, an ordained congregational minister who had turned journalist and uh, uh, worked for the New York Tribune. And uh, in fact, his uh, boss was uh, uh, Horace Greeley, the famous Horace Greeley. And it was to this gentleman that the remark, go west, young man, was made by 
Horace Greeley. At the end of the dedicatory service that day, uh, Josiah Grinnell got up and said, uh, before we leave, uh, there remains $200 that has not been uh, subscribed to the total cost of $1,800 to pay for this church building. And I propose that we raise the funds to finish the uh, job. He pointed to uh, uh, Colonel Scott, the, whom we'll see in a moment, who was a prominent Nevada uh, citizen, a lieutenant governor of Iowa at one time, and instrumental in bringing the Iowa Agricultural College to Ames, and said to Mr. Scott, and what will you pledge? And Mr. Scott got up and uh, said, well, when the man from, uh, when the gentleman from Grinnell makes his pledge known, I will make mine known. And immediately, uh, Mr. Grinnell said, I pledge $50. And Mr. Scott got back up and he said, I will match that with the $50. So very shortly, they had the full $200 raised and the building was paid for before the service was completed. At the end of that service, uh, Mr. Uh, following the raising of the $200, Mr. Grinnell said, and I will now write to my friend Oaks Ames, for whom our, this town is named, and suggest that he should give a bell to this church because it does not now have a bell. And uh, in uh, 90 days time, in less than 90 days, the church had a bell. Mr. Grinnell did write to his friend Oakes Ames, the congressman from Massachusetts, and the bell was re duly received by the church, the bell that still hangs in that church. Uh, here we have a, a picture uh, taken just recently by uh, Steve Lequa, a member of our church. And that bell, as I've indicated, still rings every Sunday morning before the church service for a few moments. And on occasion, uh, a uh, interchurch group meets there on Wednesdays to ring the bell for peace. You may know about that. The wheel of that bell is 43 inches in diameter. It's 27 inches high, 29 inches wide at the base, and 15 inches wide at the curve. Uh, it was uh, cast in Boston, Massachusetts by the uh, Hooper Company and uh, uh, is in very good condition today. Uh, Mrs. Duff, Cynthia O. Duff. Uh, she had been very instrumental in, in uh, uh, getting the church established. And she had organized the women and they, among a th number of things that they did, they uh, puttied the windows of the little building. She would be the one who brought from Syracuse, New York, the first communion service that was used in the Congregational Church from 1865 until 1902. And that communion service is uh, now held in the first Congregational Church of Ames, can be seen th on occasion at, uh, in the church uh, building up there today. A little bit about John White. We do not have a picture of John White, their first pastor. He was 30 years old when he came to Ames. And uh, we have reason to believe that his health was not good. Uh, he returned to Connecticut for a short time and again uh, desired to come to Iowa. Took a pastor at the Wittenberg Church, which is still operating north of Newton. It's about four miles north of Newton, just off of Highway 14. And the, uh, our pastor died at the age of, of 37, seven years after he had come to Ames and is buried in that cemetery. We could not find the stone down there, so several of us went from Ames. And here we see uh, Ed Collins and uh, Lawrence Hammerley of the Wittenberg uh, Church uh, probing for the stones and they were found. We found broken pieces under debris and under shrubs down there had not been uh, uh, where you could see them for many years. So we restored them. Here is what the uh, pastor's stone looked like before it was restored. And here are the three stones, the pastor on the right, uh, Reverend John White, 
his wife in the middle, she died in about 1914, I think it was, at an advanced age. And their little daughter who died in the 1870s at the age of five. And there's a group of our members from our Ames Church who uh, visited uh, the Wittenberg Church Cemetery north of Newton. From the left are Lawrence Hammerley from the Wittenberg neighborhood, George Simpson, Joan Jacobs, Reverend John Kerr, our interim pastor at the time, Ed Collins, and myself. There is the uh, uh, stone again after it's been cleaned up. Here's the pastor's stone as, you, as it appears today after it's been repaired and, and reinstated. And now in 1900, we're going to move on to the close of this particular subject. The, and by 1900, the membership was such that they needed a new church and they built this church that is a part of the present structure. It is, was greatly extended in size in 1930. You're looking uh, toward the church across the corner at 6th and Kellogg. Notice that today the street has been lowered and the pavement has been installed. And in the grading, uh, grading down of the, uh, of the streets, uh, now we have steps that go up to the uh, church entrance. They were not required when that church was first built. And here's the interior of that church building. And now I want to uh, close by just reading an excerpt or two from uh, uh, it, some letters that were written by George Tilden when he arrived in Ames in 1869. Writing to his wife back in Vermont, he said, I have just come from a Sabbath concert held in the Methodist chapel. The house was full, all young people, not a gray head to be seen. I then realized that I was in a new country, and I thought of the fathers and mothers in the church in my native town. Not a gray head to be seen. And then uh, on May 30th, 1869, he wrote, I have been to church all day, listen to a Baptist minister. The Congregational Society will have a minister next Sabbath. I went into the Sunday school this noon and I had a pleasant time. The superintendent urged me to take a class of young ladies. I declined. The superintendent urged me to take a class of young ladies. Soon, he soon returned, stating that the young ladies wished me to be their teacher, and I finally decided to take the class. Times have not changed, have they? Um, then I wish to read one more quote, and that is under the date of May 31st, 1869, written by George Tilden to his wife back in, still in Vermont. The Congregational Society held a meeting this p.m., and, and, vo and voted to enlarge and remodel the church. Ames seems to be thriving. Now I'd like to close by reading another uh, phrase that's carved into the uh, cornerstone of the National Archives on the Constitution Avenue, Avenue side, Constitutional Avenue side in Washington, D.C., and it is this. The heritage, heritage of the past is a seed that brings forth the harvest of the future. Well, thank you very much, and I'm Farwell Brown.